<clears throat> Hi, everybody. This is Dana Stangle, and this is Taranga Ranch, and welcome to our YouTube channel, and welcome to our Thursday uh, afternoon presentation. Right. This is exciting that we get to spend some time together, even if it's just virtually. And I hope that um, this can be a conversation. Right. I hope that as I'm talking about stuff today, if something comes up to you, comes up for you where you're like, oh, I really am wondering about this or that. Put it as a question because I would love to address it. Um, so. Um, Tonight's topic is backyard wildlife and deterring it humanely. And the last time I made a video like this, um, the comment was, why, why would you want to deter wildlife? And of course, I mean, I love wildlife as much as, as so many people, if not more, I love it. Um, but I know that there can be issues with wildlife in the backyard. So, um, in, and it could be all different kinds of wildlife, right? And all different situations. So in certain cases, people are trying to protect their pet from wildlife. In certain cases, people are trying to protect wildlife from their pet. Uh, in certain cases, people are trying to protect their garden from wildlife. Maybe it's a gopher, maybe it's a squirrel, maybe it's a rabbit, maybe it's deer, right? So <clears throat> we can have all different sorts of issues where wildlife is coming too close and that's not where we want it. And so what can we do to keep it further away without harming it? without engaging with it directly whenever we don't have to. So um, so we're gonna talk about deterring all different kinds of wildlife, but the main thing that I'm hoping that will be the thread that goes through this is that it's humane. It's scary, it's unexpected, but it's humane. And that means that the animal's not getting hurt. He's just having an experience, we're using the animal's senses and the animal's own behaviors to sort of train him, right? So he's already doing something. That's something we don't want. So there are annoyances that we can put in place that will make it so that he doesn't want to do that anymore. So whatever it is from the scrub jay to um, the peacock, right? Peacocks, right? I know you're sitting there and you're saying to yourself, why is she talking about peacocks? Well, I live in a neighborhood where we have peacocks and most people love them, but some people don't. And sometimes they're pooping on lawn furniture, right? So I know, right? So a lot of times, you know, I might think the deer is beautiful, but the person who's trying to maintain a rose garden might not think so. So um, we have to be open-minded about the reasons why people don't want wildlife. And we have to also think about, the reason I do this is because when people don't think about the humane ways to deal with it, they go directly to the non-humane ways of doing it because they haven't, we haven't spent a lot of time in the media discussing the humane ways to do it. It's way, you know, we like guns, we like poison, we like stuff like that. We like it to be fast and easy. Easy being a relative word, right? Um, and we like to have somebody else do it too. We don't want to have to figure it out ourselves. You know, if we hear something scratching around in the roof, the last thing we want to do is go up there and find out what it is, right? But what happens is, we hire people who use poisons sometimes or other lethal means to deal with wildlife that is where it doesn't want to be or shouldn't be, right? Or they, you know, and so get, taking it out of its ecosystem isn't really the answer when it can be dissuaded from that immediate place, right? It's still their neighborhood. The point is, you live here in this neighborhood, they live here in this neighborhood, and everybody has the right to live in this neighborhood, but they don't necessarily have the right to live in your attic, be pooping in your yard and the, making a latrine of it, or doing other damage, right? Or 
menacing pets or being fragile enough that a pet could really hurt them, which, which does happen, right? So let's get down to the fun, the fun stuff here. We've got all the props, which you know are some of my favorite things to do. So, <clears throat> um, oh, and, and, I, and before I actually get started with that, a couple of things have come up this week because, and maybe even just this month, I would say in general, people have a lot more time on their hands right now. And so they're spending more time in the yard, right? Looking around, going on walks, right? And so they're having more encounters with wildlife. And so I'm sure the perception is that there's more wildlife. And, you know, I mean, I think it's perception, but that's not the point here. The point is that people are getting closer to wildlife. And when we do that, it's a magical feeling, right? And I've seen videos this week where someone is feeding a bird from their hand. I've seen a video this week where someone is holding their arm out and putting a worm on there and a lizard is running up and he's getting this to happen every day. And, you know, the person feeding the bird from their hand, they're getting this to happen every day. And of course, everyone on social media loves this. And I'm always the jerk who says, you know, you're training wildlife. And just for the FYI, your neighbor might not be as excited when the scrub jay is flying at, at him, right? Or when the squirrel, who's used to taking the nut from the hand of one neighbor, goes to the hand of the other neighbor who's afraid of squirrels, right? Now that one's got it out for the squirrel. Why is the squirrel coming at me? Well, because the other neighbor offered him food and trained him to go where people were. So I hate being the jerk to remind people that, but it's just hard because in the end, this wildlife is fatter than the other wildlife. It's slower than the other wildlife and it's not afraid. And those aren't good things if you're wildlife. So that's just something that I wanted to throw out there. That is the opposite of what we're doing today. What we're doing today is, oh, it's too close. It's, it's going to engage with stuff. It's going to set a bad precedent. We don't want that. That's the opposite. So onward. Um, we'll start with the basic. When I'm having a backyard mystery that I cannot solve with uh, the, the prints or the poop or other you know, maybe someone saw what went on. If we don't know that, I can use a camera. And this one is pretty cheap and pretty easy to work. Um, and it makes little videos or takes little pictures. And it can tell the story when, um, when there's no other way to tell the story. So this is one of the tools that I use. Then some of the others. So it depends on what kind of an animal you're talking about, right? There's this. People are like, what's up with that? What, what, what? So this has a couple things going on for it. The first is that it's brightly colored, it's plasticky, it's not natural looking, right? So this, especially if it moves around daily, could be a good bird deterrent. They don't trust it. What's going on with, with this erratic movement with the wind, right? So that's one way this works. Another way this works is it has a stick that is in the ground. And if you were if you were holding this stick right now and the wind was blowing this, you would feel that this stick is vibrating. If I were to put this next to a gopher hole, he might not like that. Snakes too. So if I, and I don't have it out here, but this actually came in a pack of 10. While one is cute, 10 is scary. So. Cute little pinwheels, great wildlife deterrence. They also, can you hear that? They make noise. So, but again, anything that stays in the same place, um, that gets to be a habit that they get used to. So if I was using this as my deterrent, I would move it around each day, different pattern. Okay. Speaking of birds, and remember I already talked to you about peacocks. I have the ultimate peacock and other bird deterrent right here. I know you weren't expecting this. This wasn't in the picture, was it? 
This is the scary eye balloon, okay? You can see how big it is, and birds do not like this eye. They don't like it. Then I've got this flashy ribbon, and, and then you hang this from a fishing line from a tree or something, and so it's just sort of floating there, and it's very scary. Birds don't like it. It's like a beach ball, too. If you had ducks in the pool and you didn't want them there, this would keep them out of the pool. So there you have that. I know, you're welcome. I know, I know. All right, what else? Oh, since we're talking about birds, I also wanted to talk about um, this sort of thing. Now, I'm not recommending any of these product brand names at all. There are a variety of items like all of these, right? Uh, and they're all on, you can order them online or find them at Target sometimes or wherever. They're just around. So this one is something that you put on the windows and it is um, to help birds not crash into your windows. So if that's happening to you regularly, you can prevent it by putting something on the window that the bird will know, oh, there's a window there. So um, also a good thing to know about that is that a lot of times when they do that, they're not dead, they're just stunned. And if they fall the wrong way, then they might die. But if you go out, if you hear it, and you go out there and you at least set them up right, you're giving them another chance at life. So there you go. Um, what else? What else is next? Um, I'm gonna talk about lights next. Lights are also a super great deterrent. So if you've got an area where you know wildlife is going regularly or where you don't go regularly, um, it might be good to have motion sensing lights in that area. And those are easy to get at Home Depot or, or wherever, your, wherever your hardware store is or online. And you, they're easily put up and they're motion sensing and they're very bright and you know they sense the motion and they go on. That's one thing you can do. But if you've got an area that is maybe, maybe there's bushes in the way and you can't put a motion sensing light there. Maybe it's up in an attic or something. Maybe you've got an enclosed area. You can use other types of light. Now, this is one example. You could use um, a, like a lantern kind of a light. This is one that we use and we use this in an attic. This is great. You use it until the batteries die. Leave it on the whole time. They they will they will take their babies themselves and get out of there because the reason they're there is because it's dark, right? Why are they there? Why is wildlife using my yard? What's the attractant? Do I have a water feature there? Am I feeding birds out there? Is there leftover food? Am I feeding cat, cats out there and leaving food? Why are they there? So if they're if it's because it's a dark, quiet area. Light is, is part of your answer. This is one answer. If it's a place that already has a, a, a fixture um, or you wanted to use a more portable light source, you could use a strobe light. But you have to be careful with that with neighbors, right? Um, and it's not necessary. Sometimes just the fact that the area is lit up is enough for wildlife to want to move along on its own. Um, and then there's a different kind of a light that isn't used so much in the home set setting as it is on the ranch setting or larger expanses. So this one was made in response to um, people in Africa guarding cattle from African lions. And they realized it worked when the, they would walk around the enclosure all night with their flashlights on. The movement was erratic, there was no pattern, and that would keep the lions at bay. They wouldn't come for the cattle. But they realized they, were, they didn't want to be up all night. They didn't want to be, have to do that. What could they do with a light that would sort of simulate that? So this is, um, that's what this is. So this is called a fox light, and it works when an animal is looking from a distance at where it wants to be. This doesn't work when you've got trees and houses all around you. So I'm not gonna spend too much time talking about it. But the idea is that it has a variety of lights and they are not in any sort of a pattern and there's different colors. And you would have a few of these around your perimeter that would be going off at different times. So it would look like there was somebody around the area. So that's an interesting one. And again, it doesn't work 
in the regular suburban area. Um, another light situation that I have is this. I really like this one because this is actually a combination of light and noise. So this is a, a strobe flashy light and a very loud alarm. And this can be used outside and I would let the neighbors know that I was using this. I would let them hear it so that they knew when they heard it what it was and why I was using it because I don't want to scare my neighbors. Um, but this is super great. I like it because it's portable. It's easily moved wherever I need to put it. And um, it's motion sensing. And it is going to, whatever is going by it is not going to want to go by that path again after this happens. I can tell you that. It's very scary. And you, and you don't, a little of this goes a long way. This one is called the Critter Getter. I really like this one. I, I like this one in particular. I do like this one in particular. Okay, then we've got noise. Let's spend a minute talking about noise. So you can have uh, you can have a passive or an active sort of a situation going on. Passive being it's going to happen out there whether you're there or not. If you don't see it, if you have motion sensing things, then that's going to take care of itself. But maybe it's a situation where you see it happening and you just want to run out there and do something about it. And you're sort of afraid to just go out there yourself, whatever it is. I don't know if it's a fox in the chicken coop or I don't know what it is. But whatever, this one, I know it's about to be loud because it's really hard to not be loud with this, but it's really fun. Keep this, I know, right, next to the door. When you hear or see something out there that you want to scare away, right, it's very loud, easily worked, and you can get all your energy and be just super loud with all your energy. It's super great. So that's one. And another one for the same purpose, you keep it by the door in case you want to use it, is this one. And this is just a super large version of our little hazer that you can get from me if you want. Message me if you want one. This is a smaller version of this, and I'll just blow it really quick so you can see what it sounds like. I keep this by the door or on your dog walk, right? I know. I know. It's crazy. And then the little one, just so you know, sounds like this. Super loud. Almost as loud as the big one. Fits on your neck. Super great. So, um, but you might not want to engage. You might want it just to be happening out there, right? So you can use a radio. If I know that wildlife is using a part of my yard as a corridor that's close to my house and in the way of my pets or whatever, if I put a radio out there, that can help. And what I'm gonna be doing with any of these is I'm breaking a habit, right? The animal passes through that way every night or it poops in that part of the yard all the time or it's raising its babies in the attic, right? Whatever it's doing, it's doing this habitually. And it's used to doing this. So if I do this for one night, it's not going to work. If I do it for two nights, it's not going to work. I need to keep like the, the battery on this and the battery on this. I would just leave these. This is, this is a perfect attic kit or corner of the yard kit. You put it on and you leave it on until the batteries die. That's enough to break a habit. Or for two weeks, then replace it and leave it for two weeks. Two weeks is a is you're not going to have the same issues if you do it over two weeks time. I can tell you that a lot of people get impatient and they don't want to do it for that long because they feel like, oh, I haven't heard it in a day or two. But what will happen is they'll be gone for a day or two because they have other places to be. And then they'll be like, you know, I'm just going to go check that out again. And you want them to have that same. Ah! next time they go check it out. So they're like, yeah, I'm sure. I don't want to go back there. That's what you're doing. So, and then what other noise do we have? So here's one. You've probably seen things like this before. This is sort of a, a, a sonar, sort of supposed to emit these sound waves. And I have had different um, people's, I have not personally had any experience with this one yet, but and I've had mixed reviews from people who have. Some people say that it has worked great for them, and some people say that it has not worked for them at all. So if you have information about having used something like this in your garage or 
out in the yard or wherever in the garden, let me know because that would be useful information for me. And I'm about to use this one um, tomorrow on in an area where there are some ground squirrels and some um, older people who uh, need some help. So we're going to see how this works. And, and maybe so next time we get back together, maybe I'll have some more information on this one. All right. And then we've got some other stuff to talk about. And there is, oh, that's the ugly side. Sorry. There's the pretty side. The old scarecrow sprinkler. So this is a motion sensing sprinkler. So it attaches to the hose and it has batteries and the animal goes by and you can see how tall it is, right? So it sort of works on, you know, raccoons and coyotes. Smaller things might not be as easily picked up by this motion sensor, but this is good for, you know, skunks or raccoons or coyotes, that kind of thing. Even animals that like water do not like water being sprayed at them. Now, I want to be clear. I am not recommending a water gun. I don't want an animal to associate water coming out of a human person and because then they might want to turn around and retaliate, right? If they retaliate against this, they're probably not going to. They're probably just going to keep going. But if they were to, this is plastic. It doesn't matter, right? Never engage with wildlife with a water gun. Not a BB gun, because that is not humane. A paintball gun, that is not humane. That is not humane, because animals depend on their camouflage to hunt, to eat, and to defend themselves. So um, please, uh, even though you're not, and they, they hurt, just for the record, because I know people that have paintballed and they come back black and blue. So it's not humane. So just for the record, I'm just going to throw that out there. That is not what I'm recommending. But uh, the motion sensing sprinkler can be helpful. Um, and then scents. What I like to do is take some sort of um, disposable cup or plate or, or old plate that I'm not using or old ceramic pot or whatever you have laying around and a rag. And then I'll make a solution that's got water with just a little bit of ammonia or water with cayenne pepper or water with peppermint essential oil. These are things that are unpleasant to, the, to animals in many cases. Not always, but if I layer this with lights and noise, I'm creating a very unsavory situation. So this would be dipped in my solution and then put here. And now I can put it anywhere I want to. I don't want to ever, never, ever put a stinky solution on a rag and stuff it in a hole. I don't ever want to do that because that is not allowing the animal to come out and move on. What I would do is put this next to the hole so that he was like, I don't like this anymore. I can't be in this hole. That would be something I would do. But I have to remember that animals' noses are way better than ours, right? They stick out. They've got nerve endings. They're incredible. They smell things way more acutely than you and I do. So be gentle when you're using these things. Do not go crazy with ammonia and do not use it inside. It's, it's it, you know, it will make you sick and you don't want to get sick and you don't want to make animals sick. You're just creating an environment that's not pleasant. That's all. All right. And then the last thing we're going to talk about tonight is fencing. Because a lot of people will, you know, that will be the number one question when I do these talks. Will my fence keep these keep wildlife out? What kind of fence do I need to keep wildlife out? And it's at that point in the program where I usually show a picture of the border wall, right? Which is 20 feet tall and steel and cleared for 50 feet on both sides. That wall is impenetrable by wildlife because it is cleared on both sides and it doesn't have anything where an animal can gain purchase on it, right? That's the only one I've ever seen. If you have a backyard where you have a wall or a fence that you're sure works, 
I challenge you to let me know because I've never seen one. Because what happens is people will put their fence up and then the first thing they do is plant bushes, right? Or put a tree or put their pile of stuff or put their outdoor kitchen up against it, right? But whatever we do, we're creating little stairwells that make it easy for wildlife to move over a fence. And wildlife certainly doesn't look at the fence and say, oh, Mr. Smith would, would like it if I didn't go there. He did, everything for wildlife is an obstacle. All day long, they're moving over obstacles. They do not see your fence as a reason why they shouldn't be in your yard. So now then the question comes, well, what if I just put spikes at the top of my fence? That's not humane. If an animal accidentally lands on your fence, that would be terrible. And if your own cat or dog was trying to get out of your yard and impaled himself, that's what the other part of what you need to think about, especially if, if you have pets. All these things we're talking about, your pet might run into. How are you going to feel about that? If it's just a noise or a scent or, you know, that's one thing. So, you know, when people put out poison or traps or, you know, even shooting, it's not always their target that they get. So that's something to think about. Now, I have here an example of some roller fencing. Um, and people, a lot of people will ask me about this. And I'm, I'm just going to tell you some facts. I don't, you know, I don't have any interest in coyote roller fencing, but I'm going to tell you what I know. This is what it does. You know, it's so that if I'm trying to get over it, I can't, right? And if you have a dog or a cat, this would probably work pretty well at keeping them in just because dogs and cats are not wildlife. Notice on this fence sample that it has a bar going across here. As many fences do, if yours did, it wouldn't matter if this was 10 feet tall. If an animal can get to that and gain purchase there, it doesn't matter what this is doing. So, and this can be expensive. I don't know how big your yard is, but if you're trying to put this all around it, that can, that can add up. And what I'm suggesting with these other humane deterrents is that there's something that are happening much closer to the house. You're not trying to protect the whole yard. In fact, at night, if you have a pet that needs to go to the bathroom, I'm also going to suggest that you use a leash, especially if you have a yard where there is a part that you can't see because you don't know what's back there. So that is my story. Does anybody have a question? If anybody that is here right now has a question, now would be a great time for you to put it in there and I could answer it. And oh, and while while you're thinking about your question, I did have some, oh, there's a little bit I wanted to cover. Just what didn't I bring here and why not? One thing that will come up a lot, especially on social media, will be uh, other animals urine, other wildlife. I'm trying to get rid of a coyote. So I put some, I got, I ordered some mountain lion urine online. Okay, first of all, I'm wondering, where does the mountain lion urine come from? Okay, that's number one. Number two, if you live where I live, you might be attracting another mountain lion. Is that what you're trying to do? So don't mess with urine. When you can use an ammonia solution, which again is just a little bit of ammonia with some water, you don't need urine. We don't need to be getting urine from wildlife to, I mean, that's not, it's com just completely unnecessary. So don't waste your money. That's, that's, and it's probably not going to work. And honestly, I do think that a bigger repercussion could be that you could be attracting other wildlife that you were not expecting. So um, if it, it's like, it's like trying to speak a language. It's like someone says, Hey, you say these words in this language, even though you don't speak the language, right? Like dropping off scent tags when you don't speak whatever language they're throwing around, that's not cool. So I'm just going to say no to that. Um, pellets. Okay, I literally have seen a container of 
pellets that are supposed to keep snakes away. I'm not sure how that works. I don't know. Um, but in, in my experience, um, uh, pellets are not healthy. They're usually poisonous and an ingestion is now, now contact is happening right now. Now we're sort of going beyond where we really need to go. So I'm not going to suggest pellets of any kind. I'm not going to suggest that you try to get a wild animal to eat anything. Please don't leave any kind of food out for wildlife ever. Please don't do that. Um, owl. Well, you know that really cool owl with the head, you know, and he's solar powered and when he's, he's motion sensing and when he senses motion, his head goes. So I put one of those in my butterfly garden to protect the butterflies and the insects from the birds who don't care about the owl at all. So the owl looks great and I like it a lot, but for me and my purposes, it was not, uh, it was not a winner. But if you have another experience, I would love to know that. Um, what else? Uh, poison and bullets don't use them they're not good that was all that was the other other things that i wanted to cover so it looks like people do not have any questions um thank you so much for joining me tonight we will be here every thursday this was a late one because i had an appointment i know it's your dinner time thank you for making it we're usually trying to do it around three if you don't make it you can always tune in later um, so anyway, and we have a kids program going on Tuesdays at three and we still have some of those you can look back at. We just got done doing a bat series and we're getting ready to do a series on the desert. So thank you again for joining me. Please subscribe. If you have not yet subscribed to our channel, please do. I really want to be able to take this on my mobile device and I need to have more subscribers to do that. So thank you. Have a wonderful rest of your Thursday and I will see you again soon. Take care.